Okay, I'm going to tell you about a project that I've been working on actually for a long time. There's been a lot of fits and starts with trying to identify the right theory and then how to implement it. And it's something that I've been doing with uh, Xavier Ganza and Mark Torrent. Uh, and so that's orbital magnetism. And I will tell you the current state of play, which is now finally fairly advanced. Um, the thing that you'd like to calculate is pretty easy to describe. What you would like to calculate is the circulation of electrons due, say, to a magnetic field. So in a normal insulator, which is the kind of material that I study in my lab most of the time, electrons don't circulate. <laughs> so they don't have any reason to circulate. Now, what we do experimentally is do uh, nuclear magnetic resonance. So then we take this insulator and stick it in a big magnetic field. And now they start to circulate. And that's the effect that we're measuring when we're measuring chemical shielding in an NMR experiment. And I would like to be able to calculate that ab initio, or by first principles. And that's a facility that exists in some of the other codes now. It started with cast up because Picard and Maori found a method to do this. And then that method got replicated in quantum espresso and VASP. And what we have are implementing is a different method. And rather than uh, make an estimate of the um, current in a density functional theory kind of approach, what we are doing is computing the first order energy directly using techniques that I'll try to explain. Um, in my case, uh, also because um, uh, I have not implemented an external magnetic field yet, but I need some reason for the electrons to be circulating. Otherwise, I don't really have anything to test. The answer should be zero in a normal insulator. And there's a lot of ways you can write code to get zero. And there's a one right way, in my case, to write code to get zero. But I needed non-zero. And so I also implemented um, uh, nuclear magnetic dipoles uh, so that there's a reason for the electrons to circulate. And that's a method that, um, due to uh, Timo Tonhauser and David Vanderbilt and so forth, is referred to as the converse method of doing uh, NMR shielding <laughs> calculations. So the problem with calculating what you would like to calculate, as usual, in these field problems is R. So just like in a Berry's phase calculation of polarization, what kills you is the fact that you've got R, which is ruining your uh, um, periodic boundary conditions and so forth. So that leads to uh, what's now referred to as the modern theory of magnetization, which is not dissimilar from the modern theory of polarization. Uh, you can look at related quantities like the churn number. And uh, that's now, this times here is curl. OK, so this is a vector product. And so the churn number effectively is the curl of the derivative of the wave functions, which you can recast in terms of density operators as basically the curl. Notice the epsilon alpha beta gamma. Uh, so the curl of the density operators is what matters there. And these are, this is explained. I've tried to put some references uh, in this talk. The same thing can be done for the magnetization. But one of the differences here, so this is the magnetization formula that was uh, ref in the previous paper I just referenced. But one of the things that, uh, that Xavier and I did, mainly him, uh, is find a perturbative way of looking at the energy in this case. And the key is that you use um, magnetic uh, translational symmetry, which was alluded to yesterday in the talks. Uh, as well, uh, in order to transfer the magnetic issues away from the Hamiltonian and onto a perturbed density operator. And so the Hamiltonian you end up working with is a translationally periodic 
normal zero field Hamiltonian and all of the effort gets put on the computing a perturbed density operator. But because this is now the ground, the uh, field free Hamiltonian, it turns out that all you need are the conduction and valence projections of the density operator, not the full thing. Unfortunately for uh, Max Stengel and co-workers who need exactly everything but that part. So what I'm calculating is sort of the complement of, uh, of the conduction to valence transition part, but this is the part that is needed for just calculating the energy, which is only what you need if you want the magnetization, which is what my experiments need. So that's what I've been focusing on. Okay, and like I said, um, I needed also to um, add a source of non-zero magnetization, so I added magnetic dipole moments uh, as well. And then you can calculate, if you can calculate the magnetization in the presence of magnetic dipoles, you can calculate the magnetic shielding, which is the result of an NMR experiment, which is my ultimate target here. So this converse method is explained in this paper by Timo Tannhauser and colleagues. Okay, so first of all, very quickly, everything's going to be very quick because this is a short talk. Um, the nuclear magnetic dipoles, that part is relatively easy because a magnetic dipole um, can be added into the electronic Hamiltonian through its vector potential and its vector potential is uh, relatively short range and it's located at the atomic sites. So you're adding a term now which although it depends on R, depends on R relative to atomic position so it's periodic and you don't have these difficult problems. The uh, Hamiltonian gets modified, the electronic, in the usual way through the vector potential in the kinetic energy. You can do an expansion and you get an A dot P in this gauge as written here. It commutes with P and you're happy. Everything's relatively easy. Uh, you do this all in PAW because you need to have a very detailed description close to the nuclei. Uh, so the PAW part you do in real space, if you do this in atomic units, you just get two factors of the fine structure constant and everything else is simple. So this can all be computed in the PAW spheres and that's easy to do. Um, the plane wave part is slightly more effort, um, but only slightly. Its application looks a lot like applying the Hartree potential. And so I added that in the module um, space par, which is where the Hartree potential is calculated. Here it's a little harder because it's a vector valued field instead of a scalar valued field, but the um, Fourier transform can be done analytically and it looks like this. So that can be calculated once and for all at the beginning and then it can be applied as needed through um, to a wave function by the usual call to 4F, 4WF, the wave function gets transformed, it gets multiplied, it gets transformed back, okay? So that's fine. And the momentum part gets, of course, applied on in the reciprocal space first. And this is similar to how it's done in the meta GGA part of the code. So there's a, now a routine uh, in the git GHC family which applies this which is similar to how it's done for meta GGA and I will integrate them together don't worry so it won't proliferate too much code. Uh, now the other thing that we need though to do this is what the first order energy would look like in the presence of an external magnetic field and to do that and this gets um, a lot more involved you again think of this by applying a vector potential, but now the vector potential would be for the external magnetic field. So it's one half B cross R. Um, and the way that we did this is first of all to, um, you know, you need to get a total energy in the presence of a magnetic field. And then we will find the zeroth and first order energies in the presence of an external magnetic field. So to do that, we use the uh, gauge including PAW transform of Picard and Maori to properly account for the position of the projectors in the magnetic field. So this is a phase factor similar to what was, well, exactly the same as what was talked about yesterday. 
but now specifically for big R, which is the position of the projectors. Um, and that leads to what the uh, Picard and Maori papers would typically refer to as the GPA energy. And so this is just the normal PAW energy in which the uh, projectors have been properly transported in a magnetic field to prick up their phase factors. So that affects lots of things, the uh, rho ij and the densities and the overlap operator and the kinetic energy operator. Now the kinetic energy operator and buried inside rho ij is still a dependence on little r directly. So this is still doesn't have the uh, magnetic symmetry restored. That can be restored by this magnetic translation symmetry adjustment whereby, again, you write down a general operator in terms of a, trans, a periodic kernel, and again, this same uh, B-dependent uh, phase change that you just saw in the GPA uh, stuff. So what that leads to is the possibility to construct the energy thought of now as a uh, density operator and a Hamiltonian, Think of this as a minimization problem, but the constraint on the minimization problem is the density operator has to be item, item potent. And now it starts to get a little bit complicated because this is PAW. And in PAW, the item potency condition isn't P equals, uh, sorry, rho equals rho squared, it's rho equals rho s rho because the overlap operator isn't one anymore in the PAW world, okay? But you can do this and then both terms will have, uh, sorry, will have this, uh, tra this uh, translation invariance restored. And the H bar will be the field free H, okay? All of the heavy lifting gets done in this way of looking at it by rho bar. And Xavier, in the paper that we wrote together, which I referenced earlier, had figured out an expansion in both K and B, which restores for a product translation symmetry, okay? And in the case of three terms that are multiplied together, you end up with the three terms in the item potency, and this is where the magnetic field comes into play. That's the magnetic field in direction alpha. And then you have effectively all these curl-like terms, right? Because it's, it's the epsilon alpha beta gamma. And so there's d beta, d gamma, d beta, d gamma, d beta. So all the curls of the various products involved. And the complication is that now I have to worry about the curl of the overlap on top of everything else. Okay? But having done that, <coughs> you can then generate the energy that you need from just the first order density operator and this zeroth order Hamiltonian because the magnetic field dependence has all been transformed over to the density operator side, okay? So what the density, now, <laughs> the density operator itself, that was rho bar, that has to be perturbed. So the zeroth order perturbation looks like a normal perturbation, or sorry, a normal density operator item potency condition. At first order, you perturb, you get rho one bar there, and S one bar, and rho one bar. And I don't have to do any further perturbations to first order on the magnetic field part because that's already first order in B, full stop. All of this stuff down here is now zeroth order. And this is complicated as it looks, why this begins to get a little bit simple, because all of the good stuff that I need is just zeroth order information. Okay? Now, that needs to be projected onto the valence and conduction spaces. So you do that for both terms. And I'm almost, Jesus, out of time. Um, you need to have an estimate for the, um, uh, um, derivative of the density operator, so we did this by finite differences. You can play around with the projections and massage the formulas into slightly simpler forms. And then you end up with programming all the various terms of the curls, and these are what they look like. And I only spelled it out in a couple cases 
because I think if you stare slightly at it, they start to look a little bit less intimidating. Because, no, no, hear me out. So see, what, what happens here, look what happens, follow through. You start at k, you go to k plus uh, an offset in the beta direction, then to the gamma direction, and then back to k. It's taking you around a loop in k space. So what this is doing is computing everything as you go around loops. That's the circulation that you're looking for. And that circulation around a loop would be zero if there wasn't a dipolar magnetic field to force there to be a circulation. So that's the same thing for the valence space. And so what's programmed into Abinet now are a bunch of different kinds of terms. There's uh, offset overlaps of wave functions, which makes the k-space parallelization less trivial than was expressed in the last talk, but it's all been done in the polarization case, so there's a loop over k points there, just like what he talked about for bands in the last talk. You have to do the derivative of the operator, but non-lot knows how to do that, or you can do it by finite differences. The first order S is also derivatives of the C-proj. They have the normal ground state energies. This is the annoying term. This is the Hamiltonian at k between states at different k points. And there's nothing like that in Barry. Well, there is now. But there wasn't anything like that before. But, so I put that stuff in by hand. And we can talk about all the different terms later. And you also need the, the projectors in a funny way between a state at k and a projector at a different k point. But that's not that hard to do. And it works. So it's in there. This is the kind of output that you get. This is a churn number output. And it would be zero, so this is the real and imaginary part, to machine precision until you turn on the dipoles. Then you get a small value. This is the orbital magnetization in the same case. Okay? So imaginary part, which ought to be zero. Real part, which ought to be zero, except in the direction of the dipole, which I put in the x direction there. And then you get a value. Is it the right value? Kind of. So these are the relative shieldings for aluminum compared to what you would calculate in quantum espresso and VASP for several different things. And these are all reference to aluminum phosphide. So there's aluminum arsenide, purple is abinite, green is quantum espresso, blue is VASP, aluminum antimonide, similar, cubic aluminum nitride, similar. Hexagonal aluminum nitride, not so similar. Now, the scale here, these are ppm. So this is a small effect. And I don't know why I get some differences, but I do know so far that this is very pseudopotential dependent. It's very sensitive to the exact nature of the pseudopotential that you use. So there's more I've got to do there, and a lot more I've got to do to speed it up. But the basic um, outcome is that things are, are beginning to finally work. And it's all parallelized over k points. It does require PAW. And I'm really grateful to Xavier and Mark for putting up with me all these years, helping me figure out how to do this. Thank you very much. <laughs>